This is the service module, so-called, and the command module. They, we have been used to seeing, fly around like this. It is this that went to the moon that took the Apollo 8 crew, Frank Borman and his fellows, uh, to the moon and back in Apollo 8 in December. This part detaches and comes back, the command module, which I can't seem to get loose here. I assume they'll be able to do it when, when they get ready to come home. The service module is jettisoned, and this command module part is that part that comes back, 12 feet high. Now, it docks with the, uh, with the lunar module, which is this part here, uh, by simply slipping in with a docking collar, very much like that, and I hope also with a little more ease than I found to do it. They do have about a foot of leeway, but it's a very tight uh, maneuver as they come in. Actually, there's a probe on the command module that goes into a funnel-like drogue, it's called, a docking ring on the uh, lunar module. That probe fits right in. They can be one foot off, but not more, and still slip into a docking position. It's a pretty tricky maneuver. This is the lunar module itself. It's 22 feet high, uh, just about evenly divided between these two. The, this ascent stage a little bit larger in height than the descent stage. This is actually two vehicles. The two men who go through a little tunnel down into uh, this vehicle when they are docked uh, stand up in it, up in the front. They stand, they do not sit down, stand in an area about the size of a couple of telephone booths, uh, Schweikert over on the right and McDivitt over here on the left. They look out a couple of windows here and a docking window up at the top. All around here are various antenna. Uh, the uh, radar antenna for a rendezvous and S-band antenna for communication with Earth, uh, hi-fi antennas and other stuck around on the outside of the lunar module. Now, this entire thing goes down to the surface of the moon, this being the descent stage. There's a little step here, a little front porch it's called, and nine steps to the moon, which the men will descend when they get to the moon's surface. Once this engine under here has fired, and it is throttleable from 1,050 to about 9,800 pounds, that is, it can be speeded up or slowed down, to settle this gently on the moon. That settles down on these, oh, roughly one yard wide pads. Uh, these come out uh, once the, the, the uh, module has separated from its garage that takes it into space. Down on the moon, the men come out of this hatch, walk down uh, on the moon's surface. When they get back in and ready to blast off, then this engine works in here to carry them back to the a command ship circling the moon and waiting for them with one astronaut remaining aboard. On this particular mission, that astronaut remaining aboard is David Scott. Schweikert and McDivitt are, will be riding this limb for the first time in space. This thing uh, is not uh, streamlined, it's not protected in any way because it's operating only in that benign atmosphere uh, beyond the atmosphere. It's really not what we would refer to atmosphere. Out in space where there is no oxygen, where there is no resistance to speed, uh, where there are no winds to buffet it. It's so thin, as a matter of fact, to keep the weight down that as McDivitt has said, he could put his foot through it if he was uh, not too cautious. It is surrounded by a blanket to protect it from micrometeoroids and from the extreme heat out in space. The space, you know, it uh, gets down to 450 degrees below zero and up to 450 degrees above, depending on whether you're facing the sun or not. And so one side of this vehicle could be 450 degrees cold and the other 450 degrees hot, but it will spin to equalize uh, those temperatures so that uh, it won't bake on one side and freeze on the other. Let's go to the uh, Grumman Aircraft Engineering Company out in Beth Page Long Island, which manufactures this vehicle. And there, Steve Rowan and Scott McLeod are standing by. Steve, come in. Walter, as you say, the LEM is an, a completely different vehicle. It's, uh, of course, not aerodynamically designed to fly in the atmosphere, and therefore it's kind of an ugly-looking vehicle, I suppose, pretty to the engineers and pretty to the men who've worked with it, like Scott McLeod, Grumman's chief consulting pilot. Uh, Scotty Walter has mentioned some of the things that the LEM must do. Uh, how does that make it different? First of all, of course, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have any streamlining outside. Well, that's true, Steve. It doesn't require any st streamlining, as Walter had mentioned. In addition, since we don't require 
any work in the atmosphere, we have no heat shield. If the men cannot return to Earth in the LEM, they must go back to the command module first. It's the first spacecraft with two engines, isn't it? Uh... Yes, it is. It has, as Walter had mentioned, the throttleable descent engine and also an ascent engine. So it's really two spacecraft in one. Right. And uh, aside from that, and aside from, of course, the rendezvous radar and things it needs to get back to the command module, uh, is it greatly different than, uh, than any other spacecraft? Well, no, it's not that different, Steve. Uh, what we've tried to do in the LEM is use everything that has been used in other spacecraft as much as possible. This uh, disk key, as we call it, the computer keyboard, is just about the same, then, as the one in the command module. Yes, it is. All of our controls and displays the eight ball, our artificial horizon, and each one of the controls, as much as possible, is the same as the command module, so that when the crew comes into the LEM, they won't be going into an entirely different environment. And, uh, of course, the one thing that is different, Scotty and Walter, is the fact that they don't have couches, they don't even have uh, stools to sit on in the in the LEM, so they're going to have to stand up just as we'll be standing here to help describe their activities. Walter? Scott, uh, welcome to our CBS uh, News space broadcast. Uh, a first ever for Scott McLeod with us on this, and we're glad to have you aboard to uh, show us through these LEM maneuvers. Thank you, Walter. Uh, Scott, by the way, uh, that business of standing up really isn't a terrible chore since you're weightless anyway, as long as you've got some uh, some restraints to keep you from floating up and hitting your head on the ceiling there, huh? Well, that's true. Uh, you have cables similar to these, if you can see them, that attach to the suit. And in addition, there is Velcro on the bottom of your boots and on the deck of the spacecraft. So this keeps you attached fairly firmly to the spacecraft. Is that maybe the way we're going to walk around in space passenger vehicles of the future with that Velcro on our uh, boots? Well, well, I guess we have the alternate of either something like Velcro or an artificial gravity. A spinning of the uh, spacecraft to create a gravity. Yes. Well, we'll be back frequently. Well, stand by. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 9 will continue in a moment. If you knew of a machine that stretched all the way from New England down the East Coast, a machine that connected people together east, south, north, and west. Wouldn't you say it had to be the most complex machine in the world? Well, there is such a machine, and it's called the Bell Telephone Network. Western Electric people built or provided much of it. You see, Western Electric is the manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell system. We make things your Bell Telephone Company and other Bell Telephone Companies across the country need to bring you dependable phone service. So you can call any place you want, anytime you please, and get the one phone you want out of millions and millions of phones. And usually for small change. Western Electric. Doesn't our name have a familiar ring? T-minus 32 minutes and counting uh, here at the Kennedy Space Center for the launch of Apollo 9 and its 10-day Earth orbital mission, a highly critical one to make the schedule of landing man on the moon this uh, year. We've been talking about how critical the lunar module is to the success of Apollo 9 and to the success of the entire Apollo program. Uh, the LEM's been in development for over six years now, since NASA first accepted the concept of a vehicle which would ferry astronauts between the Apollo mothership and the moon. And NASA made that decision a year after work uh, had begun on the command module, and like the command module, the LEM has had its share of growing pains, and David Schumacher tells us about them. Strange. It doesn't have to fly in the air, so it's not aerodynamic. And it's, it's sort of grotesque. It looks a lot like a spider sitting there on its legs. And, but I think for the job that it's designed to do, it can do it. Jim McDivitt was not always so confident. He and his fellow astronauts have watched with understandable concern as engineers tinkered with the LEM over the years, making changes to improve it, then changing the improvements. 
Tracing the lem from its first concept through to its present incarnation gives some idea of how radical those changes have been. Part of the problem was they had to start to work before they really knew what they needed to land on the moon. Weights has been a crucial problem all along. A tenth of a pound saved was cause for cheers. Metal was shaved wherever possible and in some cases shaved too closely. A fuel tank pared down to save weight finally burst and had to be redesigned again. The first lem got all the way to the launch site only to be shipped back to the factory because of fuel line leaks. And just last month, nine fittings on the latest lem were replaced because of a kind of metal fatigue. The Apollo fire caused the same kind of retesting and rethinking of the lem as it did of the main spacecraft. The interior was rechecked and then more delay as flammable material was removed, wiring redone, and fire extinguishers installed. The astronauts, too, added to the wait and the delay by insisting they wanted radar on board so they could monitor the rendezvous. The engineers got even by taking away their couches and forcing them to stand, but the astronauts didn't really mind because the trip is short, after all, and besides, now they can get closer to see out the rendezvous window placed awkwardly over their heads. But the most serious problem has been with the engines. The ascent engine in its ground checkout developed trouble, something like a knock in your car's engine. The repair bill was slightly more, though, $5 million. The decent engine has had its problems, too. It also ran rough, and then two of them blew up during ground tests. Finally, months behind schedule, everything was put together, and the first and only LEM to fly so far lifted off its launch pad at Cape Kennedy. There were no men aboard this one. Neither engine worked as planned, but NASA decided the engines were not at fault, blamed electronics, and called the test a success. Still, a year later, a manned lem was not ready. And so, Apollo 8 carried thousands of pounds of water and not a lem to the moon. It seemed only fitting somehow that if there was to be a lem simulator to teach astronauts how to fly the lem, it should have trouble too, and it did. Or rather, they did. Two of them crashed. No one was hurt, but officials decided the training was more dangerous than the mission and grounded the trainer. Despite its hard luck history, George Skirla, the man responsible for assembling the LEM at Cape Kennedy, is still confident. We've had our problems, but I think they, they're all uh, uh, developmental problems, and the spacecraft is a very sophisticated spacecraft. And uh, we had problems with LEM-1 that we solved, and the vehicle was launched and flew successfully. And we had some problems with LEM-3, and we've solved those fully expect that that vehicle will fly and fly well. And one of the two men, who is betting his life at will, also has reviewed the problems. Now, when we started out, we, meaning the Grumman Company and NASA, to learn how to build a spacecraft like this, there were a lot of problems. We had super lightweight wiring and super lightweight everything. And there were some things that were just too super lightweight. And we made those a little heavier. But we went through the development, and, and we were assigned a LEM-2 saw it go through its growing pains, and we got LEM-3, and, and it uh, saw its growing pains. But we've reached a point now where I have great confidence in the spacecraft. It's nothing, nothing wrong with it. It showed itself in tests to be very reliable. Despite the public confidence of the men who build and will fly the LEM, there will be a collective sigh of relief when this mission is over. For all the publicity of the hazards of Apollo 8's flight to the moon, it is this flight of Apollo 9 that has concerned insiders most and will really determine whether we'll be successful in our commitment to land a man on the moon before the end of the year. David Schumacher, CBS News, Kennedy Space Center, Florida. What's going to happen today beyond the liftoff itself, once this spacecraft is in orbit, is this. This is what actually goes into orbit. The S-4B, the third stage of the Saturn V rocket, once it is in orbit, on its second revolution over Australia, uh, this spacecraft and, the, and its service module, which actually form the spacecraft, separate from the S-4B third stage. Then four panels do not come off like this. They blow off in space, exposing the lunar excursion module, or the lunar module, it's called now. The excursion was dropped for fear it might sound like a picnic in the park or something, but the lunar module uh, is exposed there. Then the, uh, the command module is turned around and comes back and docks with the lunar module. 
and then later springs eject the lunar module and push the entire spaceship and its lunar module away from the S-4B, which is then fired to go into solar orbit. Then this is the equipment with which these men will be uh, working, experimenting on the rest of the first five days of this flight. We can now go out to uh, Downey, California, where at North American Rockwell they build the spacecraft and where Bill Stout and Leo Krupp, our uh, uh, Downey astronaut, can show us just what has to take place for that delicate maneuver of docking today. Bill? <laughs> 